Okay, here we are again. Thank you everyone who's there. Back to Wisdom is Bliss, the four friendly fun facts that can change your life. And uh, by me. And uh, this is, in a way I was thinking in between previous session and this one, how it is actually a dream of a writer who is writing a, a teaching thing in the sense that when you finish writing something or giving a talk, you always feel you could do it better, added something, gone this way and that way, and, uh, and you didn't, and so then you want to do something else. Whereas when you, if you go back over your thing and, have a, and can record what deeper other thoughts or what digressions you could put that would help illustrate it more, which you've edited out to make it readable, it's really a dream and it's, it's really wonderful, it's great. And because after all, the nature of language and ultimate reality is such that you could almost say the opposite of whatever you say. <laughs> you can find a way and a context to do that. And so if you do say something that you feel will be helpful with, with an openness that you know you could in a way come at it in another angle to give someone else a different opportunity of entering what you're trying to talk about, it's really great. It's quite good. It's quite unusual. So reality is fun, I promise. So it's like you're doing an oral palimpsest about what is written on a page. It's quite a lot of fun. So I feel confident in saying that's where I had stopped on page nine, uh, toward the bottom of the page at the subheading of reality is fun, I promise, and I hope I can still make that promise now that I'm reading it, I hope so. I feel confident saying that we have all had real fun at some time in our lives. If we are carrying a lot of pain, however, we may not remember having had fun. Maybe it was only in the womb or at the breast, or maybe in only the tiniest relief in the midst of anxiety or agony, only in the slightest distraction from our pain. If we never, that's what that we ever had fun, in other words, that means, if we never had any relief of pain or the fun of even a tiny pleasure, then why on earth would we be able to imagine it as possible? Or why would we lament its lack or absence? Why? Because we have to have had some fun to feel we, we like it. <laughs> that's really great. That's quite true. If we never had any relief of pain or the fun of even a tiny pleasure, then why on earth would we be able to imagine it as possible? Or why would we lament its lack or absence? When we do have any kind of fun, a bit of relief, like I'm having relief in my knee now by putting my foot down, I, I have to do it gently. Uh, when we do have any kind of fun, a bit of relief, a moment of pleasure, a consoling happiness, a wave of joy, or even some type of bliss. We still don't think it's fun if we focus on how much more we could be having, or if we reminisce about how much more fun we had before. So this is how we can spoil our fun with our concept of pain and fun, which are actually operating all very much all within all of this. I mean, you know, concept operates at a very minute muscular tension level with the body, because the body and mind are really in one, in one way. In one way they're different, in one way they're, if you know about subtle body, they're really the same. There's always, mind and body are always there together, even at the most advanced spiritual state. Don't ever think you can reach pure mind outside of body. That's like a, that can be useful as a lure for someone who's really freaked out about the body. But body and mind are always together, they are. But that's how you ruin your fun. When you're having fun, you, you mend your mind, your concepts start to compare it to what you can remember or what you can imagine, either forward, backward, or forward. And then it, you ruin it. <laughs> I aim to show you how you can come to understand that reality is fun, the playful joy of your life when you're in touch with your own deepest reality. That understanding will enable you to feel it through and through, in your mind and in your flesh and in your bones. It will lead you to step by step to discover what the Buddha discovered, 
that there is an ultimate reality, a reliable reality, a durable reality, a diamond-like reality, indestructible, even though maybe not hard and, and cold and sharp-edged like diamonds tend to be, but diamond in the sense of supremely valuable, supremely beautiful. Engaging in that reality is fun, even super fun. And you can find it yourself. You actually are engaged. We're all engaging in it right now, actually. The trouble is we don't fully know it. We don't really know it. We tend not to, or we tend only to get a tiny corner of it or something. You know, probably couldn't bear life if we didn't have some openness to it. And we wouldn't have become human if we didn't have openness to it, because we wouldn't be risking some fake kind of security of being some hard-ass lower animal like a rhinoceros or something, and give up that security of the hide and the tusk and the strength and the size and in order to be more soft and more, and more aware and open to contact and touch with reality, because it's the armor blocks us from doing you know? So we all have it, that indestructible, but engaging it is super fun and you can find it in yourself. You can know it, can feel it, can be it. At least Buddha assures us, and I think I can see it now and then in others and in myself, a little bit of it. And the neat thing is that you can be confident you will find it because you are it, you are in it, as it, already. In fact, there is no other way to reach your super fun Buddha nature as something else. You have to see it, know it, feel it, be it. As you, I put them all dash, 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 see it, know it, feel it, be it. As you, yourself, must have always been in reality. That's a little leaping, I agree. <laughs> but where that leaps is in my, that's leaping at my consolation prize at the end of the book. I'm not going to give it away. But that means that whenever we do get to where we really know, where we really simultaneously feel that we are the nourishing reality of the unbreakable clear light of the void, when we do, we will know we were always there. That can collapse time in a way where we access all time infinitely, logically speaking, given the infinite of possibility, the infinity of possibilities. We will get there. We, we, we and which will mean we know we will know then that we are there already. <laughs> this is a shock to imagine, of course. It's, if it's too much, you can just dismiss it since you are free. This is a free life. Whether or not you can be miserable if you like. Whether or not your country happy, you could be perfectly happy and then decide to just uh, smack yourself <laughs> and stab your arms sting. You can, you're free to do that. Whether or not your country happens to be free, the world is free. Because freedom is another name for reality. Reality is the always accessible face of fun. That's it. So, for example, freedom, the ridiculous dictators, you know, Putin, Xi Jinping, Lee Kuan Yew, Maduro, uh, Bashar Assad, any of these ridiculous dictators, you know, they, they can say freedom is some Western fantasy or something like that, and they can choose to do so because they're free. <laughs> But it isn't Western, it's reality. Okay? So therefore, the more a society organizes itself along the basis that people are free, and therefore tries to get them to mobilize their freedom in positive ways, the better the society, of course. There's absolutely no question. It's like a duh. You know, it is, it's even a shock that people could even think that like some complete, like, bomb the czar, you know? <laughs> was, that, that, that's the be all and end all of the society, you know? No way. Give me a break. Viktor Frankl, an Austrian psychiatrist who survived incarceration in a Nazi death camp, wrote, happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. That is to say, start out from where it is, which is right here. When you let everything go 
and fully face the reality before you, even in a condition of profound misery, happiness can well up seemingly from nowhere. And actually, you know, but you know, that's, of course, that's a kind of a grim statement because you know the torture victim who, the, who, who is in the hands of a clumsy torturer, let's say, who doesn't know how to be exquisitely cause pain without killing someone, but who's clumsy and actually does kill them. Well, what the de dying then is, is relief. That's where happiness wells up. That's where you smashingly contact clear light. And the, but the point is, you're so contracted at that time, if you're an ordinary, paranoid, and unenlightened person, then you will be scared to feel totally open, because although you do, you will, you, although you actually do, because a huge relief of not the bad torture that you were crushed in, you'll feel a huge relief, which death is, you'll be terrified of it because you won't know what it is, and you'll feel a worse crushing will be coming. So you will black out and not experience it and not enjoy it and then conjure up a kind of dreamlike illusory condition of being a being who's running away from being tortured, a torturous kind of between state. And then you will look for forms of life, forms of changing that state into something where you think you can really escape from that torturer or have revenge on, revenge on that torturer and so forth. So in a way you stay in the torture zones in the bardo, in the between. That's how it comes seemingly from nowhere. It's dead. That's the, that's, so that's describing death, actually. When you let everything go and fully face the reality before you, even in a condition of profound misery, happiness can well up seemingly from nowhere. That's, what, that's the real relationship of life and death. Death is, death is becoming close to totally one with clear light. And therefore, if, unless you have really engineered in your, through your dharma practice in your life a totally open form of being, you cannot experience that death blissfully because you will immediately cover it with a between of where you're going to run and get some security. Because even though it feels great, you're scared that great feeling is just a precursor of being tortured. You follow? If you haven't cultivated oh, more openness. Wow. You might feel I have claimed a lot for this book. Well, it's many other, many others. I'm not exclusively claiming for this in a way, but this is one of them. I'm saying this is born of that, and I think it is. Sorry, I, must, I might be crazy. Then just forget about it if you think so. Some of you might even feel it's like a pop-out book, and on a special page, something will pop out, and you'll suddenly see, no, feel, and be all that you can be. <laughs> I love that because my cousin was General Max Thurman, who invented that slogan for the all volunteer army, <laughs> supposedly. Really, I was told that by, I didn't know him personally, but I was told that by a cool cousin that we had that did know both of us and told me that was a fact. Oh, so maybe it is. But I like saying it in about this, you know, rather than join the army. Be, be all that you can be because you join something amazing. And what you join is yourself, your clear light openness access, your clear light wisdom, that is, which is your openness and access to reality, which is infinite, energized, nourishing openness. Okay? Infinite openness and infinite energy. And off you'll go, like being on a roller coaster or like a surfer on a big wave. Well, whatever. I like that. Well, yes and no. This was really fun, I think. I did a good job here. Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that at any moment you could have an epiphany. What in the Zen, that's like where a theistic person sees God or sees an angel, you know, something higher or something more open. What in the Zen tradition might be called a satori, a flash of enlightenment. The earth could move under your feet, or it moves under your butt, I guess, when you have an orgasm in the, in the, the, for whom the bell tolls in Hemingway, or, or whatever, you know. Uh, under your feet, the sky got bluer over your head. The sun burst through the clouds. 
and the deep connectedness to reality in the center of your heart flash into your awareness. But no, so that's yes. But no in a practical sense, because what we all need is a process of education, or in the case of most of us, a re-education, a higher education, even a super education, which is what I'm using, because higher education in my graduate school, what I used to teach, was not high enough, <laughs> in my opinion. But it was helpful. It is helpful. I still stand by it. I still like it. I, would su I support it. But by itself, it's not high enough. Since many, because they don't really help people develop fuller way of how to use their instrument of their intelligence. They give feed information to the intelligence. They give skills to the intelligence to manipulate things. But they don't open the intelligence more. They don't, or, they, or they would have meditation classes in the gym, which would not be from any kind of particular religion. It would be from the psych department. It would be how to open the mind of a person. Become more aware of, of, your, reality, of your peripheral vision, of your in, in, introspective internal vision. That should be part of education. It's, it totally is. It's not religious. It's how to live. It's teaching people how to be, to, how they themselves are an instrument of experience. They're a scientific as well as poetic instrument of experience. And how to, how to use that instrument more fully is what they should learn. There should be yoga classes, not just football and basketball classes in every university. And the undergraduate, in high school, in grade school. Instead of some religion that thinks it's just believing something and a rigid dogma, dogma based, let's repeat the slogan. <laughs> I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. Like a parrot. That's not education, it's indoctrination. Super education. Since many of us have been over indoctrinated into a worldview that assures us falsely, without proper evidence, that there is no such thing as an ultimate reality that is the free bliss of the sheer joy of endless fun. For example, which person, which form of theism, Abrahamic or Hindu or whatever, although I think the Hindus are a little closer. But which form said that God is having fun? Who said that? Teresa d'Avila did, because she had a wedding with the Savior. She melted into him, body and soul and mind. And then she had to go and whip herself for a week in between sessions to make sure it wasn't Satan. Well, the, the father confessor had to do that. And she had to do that because they were burning other people down the street from her uh, every day at that time in Spain. But who actually in the general in Sunday church mentions that God is having fun? No, they say God's son, God is his son, right? The Trinity. But he's being strung up on a cross to kind of grind in you with your misery. Well, there can be a nice thing that's empathic to you in that way. But then you really emphasize only that misery part. Not, well, then he resurrected from that, but that, you don't see that. They don't present that to you. You hear about it, but you don't see it. So who says that? Otherwise, I'm one with God, I'm having fun. Then a mystic says that in Islam, and they kill him. Oh, he's arrogant. They kill them in, 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 in any, of, any of the uptight Hinduism. There were other, some types of it, some ways of interpreting it, but some mystic. Like there was that one lady who went around naked. What was her? Lala now, or some Leela or something. You know, and she went around and she was naked because she was so happy. And she wasn't scared of anything. And she was one with uh, Krishna. But they like, they, they had to, I don't know, they punished her for that, freaked them out. Silly. So they falsely assure us there is no such thing as an ultimate reality. They would, you would call it God, if you like, I don't care, you don't have to call it clear light. That is the free bliss of the sheer joy of endless fun. The not just further, not just higher, but super education in this book has three parts. 
It is a super education in science. It is a super education in ethics, because you have to treat everybody well, even though you may not feel like it always. You will when you're enlightened, because you will feel they are you. And it's just like you don't want to be mean to your hand. You know, so you're not going to be mean to other people, so you're going to be ethical to them. And a super education in the meditatively concentrated mind power that takes the science and the ethics to the summit, to the max, so to speak. So those are the three educations, three super educations. We have, uh, we don't really teach ethics much worth, worth anything in Western, in philosophy department or in religion department. We don't really teach it in that university. And that's why we have so many graduates who are unethical. They go out and they make corporations that ruin the planet just for money because we don't really teach them ethics. We do teach them science, thank heaven. And indirectly through teaching them literature and humanities and something like that, we teach them about the sensitivity of the mind to some extent, but it's only indirect. We don't directly help them improve their instrument. Athletics sort of do, but they're not really because the athletics teach them how to be armored in a violent way with sports competitive. They don't teach them yoga, like the athletics of, we little do ballet dance in the art department maybe. So it's not, it's not black and white again, but they're not, they only have little flashes of super education. Super education is what we're talking about. Now the super education in detail. So three super education serve as your path to such a state. Though I talk of path, remember that you are already there, as you will ultimately recognize. So your journey is to find out where you already are. That's really key, a key reassurance for you to know that. So you don't think it's some alien weird thing, you have to go to, to, go to like Timbuktu or something to find it. You're already there. You have it in New York City. You have it in wherever you live. You have it in your classroom. You have it in when you're reading a book. You have it when you're listening to this. But you're not enjoying it as much as you could as if when you get super educated and you maybe have a flash and then you and this super education how to build on that flash ethically scientifically and meditationally and mentally that's how it teaches you this threefold path is completely divided into eight branches so it is commonly known as the eightfold path this is actually, we're jumping here to the fourth friendly fun fact of the fourth friendly fun fact, fourth noble truth of the Eightfold Path, the therapy method of healing yourself from not knowing your inner health and your inner energy and your inner vitality, and therefore feeling sick with unhappiness, be living in the first friendly fun fact situation where you're told that's what it is, but you're told you don't have to stay there. That's why it's fun. You're told what, to f what you have to depart from. That's all. Because you're told what causes it and how to overcome its cause, and that you can overcause cause it in the second and the third. So we're there on the fourth. The science super education is divided into realistic worldview and realistic motivation, which goes right with the worldview. The ethics super education is divided into realistic speech, realistic evolutionary action. When you know that your acts are influencing your future state, it becomes evolutionary. That's why you won't do bad things, because that will lead to your bad future state. Realistic livelihood and realistic creative effort. And finally, the mental super education is divided into realistic mindful awareness and realistic meditative concentration. And of course, this is just arbitrary, the splitting them up. It's all one thing, really, the super education, but it's helpful to look at them in this way. In sum, you need to develop your knowledge, your self-control, your health and your energy, your lucid wakefulness, and your super focus. Then you will become able to know what, where, and how you are going to have more fun while bringing more fun to all your beloved companions and friends, and even your enemies, who won't, by the way, which you should do, have, help them have fun, because once they have fun, they won't bother to be your enemy. 
They only are your enemy when they think you are blocking their fun. It won't harm you anymore once they are having too much fun to bother with hurting you. Now you may be thinking, is he talking to me? Why should I do this? How can I do this? Is there some other way for me? <laughs> if you're thinking something like that, it's a good sign. Of course you can find other keys to the door I'm opening for you. If you have another key that works for you, more power to you. I do know that this particular set of keys I present in this book works very well. They have been tried and true. They work for me. They have been so far. They have been, not, but not totally. Of course, nothing. That I, this, I didn't use them that well still, but I'm getting better and better. But anyway, they have been tried and true over thousands of years for countless individuals in numerous languages, countries, and cultures. If you have them of different religions, they might have been Taoist or Buddhist or Confucianist or Hindu or different kinds, which really there's no Hindu, but Shai Shiva is, Vaishnavist, Shakti is, there are a number of different religionists. And they work for them all. If you have them in numerous languages, countries, and even cultures, if you have them in your hand, you might as well try them out. If you change your mind later on, you can always get another set. After all, you are free, you are human, you are intelligent, you are sensitive, and you can make your own decisions, therefore. It may be that the countless beings who have perfected, have preceded you and me, and are now already enjoying the super fun of enlightenment, are monitoring our classroom, this world, and have tweaked our destiny as humans on this planet through our sciences, arts, technologies, histories, and so on. They are following their Star Trek Prime Directive <laughs> by not interfering openly in our evolutionary progress, but subtly planting hints and clues, as in a gigantic game of clue or quest or treasure hunt. For example, how about all our different artists, our musicians, our Ravi Shankar Vina players with their ragas, our Vivaldis, Bachs, and Beethovens, how could I miss a Mozart? Come on, Mozarts. Our Leonardos, our Don Kappas, our Dogens, Nagarjunas, our Descartes, Kant, Heisenberg, and Einsteins, our Shakespeare's, Scorsese's, Spielberg's, Lucas's, our great poets, Sappho's, Kalidasa's, Shantideva's, Keats Shelley's, and Emily Dickinson's. They play their instruments, invent their theories, build their mechanisms, tell their stories, write their poems, and sweep us down the rivers in their harmonies and transporting flights of sound and light and vision. Things seem so desperate today. Technologies of environmental pollution, reckless resource extraction, and war power destruction being so overwhelming as to jeopardize our lives and the future prospects for all beings on this planet. It seems as if we have no alternative but to take responsibility for ourselves and do whatever we can to make things better, starting with cultivating our own adaptability and resilience. We also might as well have some fun in the process. This, that's what makes you adaptable and resilient, by the way. As we may have noticed that we, oh yeah, I say that, as we noticed that we are more resilient and adaptable when we are having some sort of fun. Now is the time for all good people to come to the aid of themselves and their world, including their own nation and their neighbor. I myself, I'm still a work in progress, but in the last 60 years, thanks to the kindness of teachers, parents, children, and friends, I have discovered enough about my own Buddha nature to be confident about yours and to know this book can be helpful to you. How helpful? You will end up happier and also a better person. You may well worry that perhaps some can be happy and yet become worse people. Being happy in spite of being egotistical and selfish and even sometimes harming others. And of course, they do say, these kind of powerful people, I'm so happy. Oh, I love being the czar. I love being this, that they say that. But this is precisely where we are wrongly educated and we, because we shouldn't believe them, how stressed if we were looking. And if you got a little more happy yourself, you'll see how stressed they really are, desperately claiming to be happy. 
and need the Buddha's super education. Actually, a happy person is not just someone who shouts out how happy they are. A really happy person is one who feels real streamings of bliss and satisfaction in their body and mind. Or if they live orgasmically, let's say, just say, doesn't mean they have a lot of sex necessarily. Doesn't mean they chase other people necessarily. They feel the inner, inner streaming, like, or like Wilhelm Reich, blue energy. The blue energy, the blue orgone or orgasmic energy of, of deep reality, clear light of the bliss. It emerges from its diamond reality in a blue energy, like Doctor Who. A really happy person is one who feels real streamings of bliss and satisfaction in their body and mind, automatically wants to share that with others, automatically feels it unnecessary for others to be so miserable, and naturally has the skillful gesture that lifts others around them into relative good cheer, even just by their presence. This guidance has come down to me through the ages. I know the spiritual and scientific ancestors in a little bit of detail, how they benefited and enjoyed and had fun themselves. And I'm having more and more fun myself as I go along. So why should I not give it out from my heart to yours? Since the capacity is all already there in each of you as it is in me. Take it or leave it, it's up to you. Whatever you decide, I wish you all the best of luck and blessings. So I actually finished chapter one. So all the best to you. And uh, let's dedicate the merit. If you got through listening, I dedicate the merit of getting through reading and commenting to all beings quickly discovering the bliss of wisdom and the bliss of reality through discovering, through knowing the bliss of reality to whatever degree more than they already do to be just like us and just like Buddha, all of us. So we have a Buddha land, a Buddha verse, a Buddha America rather than an ego America, ego verse, a universe. Okay. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and or uh, an ego planet, a Buddha planet. Not in the sense of Buddhist, but in the sense of people being enlightened enough to being nicer to and kinder to each other all the time and to the animals around them all the time as a natural, normal thing. And the earth responding with great crops, with great balanced wind, fire, water, air, Earth. May that be so quickly as possible. Thank you.